If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Oh, I'm excited for this one. We had uh, a good time. We got to meet with one of the, I don't know, what would you call him? Like one of the gods of CrossFit? <laughs> whoa, whoa. Well, he's, well, no, he's yeah, one yeah, of the OGs. Yeah, in that world. He's an OG. He's one of the yeah. OGs. I watched, I watched Jason, and I think I've mentioned this on the show before, which is why I was so excited to finally get him in here. I watched Jason working out in a parking lot to a gym doing these uh, made up cross. And I think he talks about it on the show, the CrossFit wads back then. And this is like the very beginning of all of it. And I remember my buddy telling me, watch this kid, dude. He's going to be a bad. He must have been like 19, 20 years old. Well, Jason yeah. Kalipa it was a very successful CrossFit competitor and now has to be one of the more successful CrossFit uh, box owners, although now a lot of his boxers are no longer CrossFit. He started that way, right? Right. How many gyms is he on? Like 20? He's over 20. He's got like 20 locations. Worldwide. Uh, worldwide. Extremely successful. He also has a very interesting personal story. Hmm. Um, his young daughter- Powerful. Uh, uh, you know, was stricken with a life-threatening disease and is undergoing or undergoing chemotherapy for treatment. And- he talks a little bit about that. Uh, it's pretty touching. The guy's a, he's a really good guy. Super genuine dude. Very, very genuine yeah. dude. Very good, good guy. Again, he's very influential in the CrossFit um, world. Uh, for more information on Jason Kalipa, you can go to his website, which is Jason Kalipa, Kalipa spelled K H A L I P A dot com, or you can go to Ava's Kitchen dot org, A V A S Kitchen dot org, and I believe there's. Uh, I believe there's a way where you can donate money or whatnot to the, to some organizations that'll benefit, uh, you know, research uh, for children. His Instagram page is at Jason Kalipa, and we do talk a little bit about training. We mostly talk about business, mm -hmm. and we talk about his personal story. And if you're coming over and listening to this episode, and you've never listened to Mind Pump before, and you're a CrossFit uh, trainer, afterwards we had a nice conversation with Jason, and he agreed that. Our uh, Prime and Prime Pro programs will probably benefit CrossFitters the most. Now, these are correctional programs, so not workout programs. So you can continue to do your CrossFit WOD or workout, but what these programs do is they come with self-assessment tools mm -hmm. to help you correct potential muscle imbalances or recruitment patterns. And address issues. it relatively quickly, which is always like something to consider you well, know, going into your workout. It's also very specific to them. Like right now, I know like a lot of times when you do CrossFit wads, you kind of do this group mobility warm up, which is still pretty good. It's better than nothing. But what this will do will address your specific needs and how you should be warming up before you do it. Individualize anything. your experience a little bit more. Right. right. So how you prime your workouts should be very individualized based on your recruitment patterns, based on your imbalances, your weaknesses, your strengths. Um, and if you prime properly, you just lift better. Um, and that's in MAPS Prime. But it also comes with MAPS Prime Pro, which is purely correctional. It focuses on the wrists, the neck, the, the spine. It focuses on the shoulders and the shoulder blades the hips, the ankles, the feet. Um, it's a very comprehensive correctional program that uh, athletes get a lot of benefit from. So for more information on the MAPS Prime and Prime Pro programs or the Prime Bundle, which takes them, to, puts them together and discounts them, just go to mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are talking to Jason Kalipa. I'll start with your background, man. I didn't know you've been in fitness th that long. You've been in, you've been in this for as long as we have. Yeah. So I got. Let's see. I started working at the conventional gym called Milpitas Health and Fitness. Oh my and, god, I remember that gym. Yeah, you know that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I started working there when I was let's see, fifteen. So at fourteen, I started at a community center. I used to ride my bike there on the summer and did like a summer job there. And then when I was 15, 16, I started working at the conventional gym behind the front desk. I used to, you know, give people towels, sell them Gatorade, et cetera. And um, so that was throughout high school on the weekends and uh, mainly on the weekends. And then once I graduated from high school, I, I was inspired to, to do more, right? And uh, I was kind of a wise ass in high school. I didn't perform as well as I should have. Um, I met my my wife when we were 14. Um, we've been together ever since. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. And so we have two kids together. And so, you know, I met my wife all was well. I had a bunch of friends. I was popular in high school. And then a lot of them went off to college and I was planning on going to college and doing different things. But then the problem was I didn't get into any of the schools that I was looking to get into, specifically Santa Clara University right up the street. 
And so when I was working the front desk, I used to see this guy, Min, making tons of money selling gym memberships, and I was inspired. Um, so when I graduated from high school, I went to West Valley, and I, I the first day of school kind of like woke me up. I was like, you know, no one really cares about me. I got to get my shit together, right? <laughs> and so I really started um, working hard. Um, I, I eventually got into Santa Clara. I graduated from Santa Clara University, same time as my wife, same time as my friends. But on the road there, when I graduated from high school, I started doing sales at the at the gym. Mm-hmm. And so a typical day would be, you know, go to um, West Valley in the morning, go to the gym, work out. And then I would work until late. Like that, that prime time was like from four to seven when you had a lot of walk-ins, a mm-hmm. lot of leads. So I would do a lot of sales then. And then um, I'd go home and work on homework and Throughout college, uh, you know, I, I I started a clothing company that didn't do very well. Made some investments that didn't do very well, but the sales of the gym was was a good thing and it allowed me to buy my wife a wedding ring. So we it was all we good. talk about all the first off, Min. I think I know him. Did he come from Twenty Four? Uh, I think he did. Tran Min. Min uh, no, no, win. No, no, I don't well, know. Might, okay, there might oh. be a few. Okay, wins. but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we talk about it all the time. How if you learn, if you want to learn sales skills, one of the best places to learn is in a gym with a lot of volume because the sales cycle so fast that like if you sell cars or houses or something like that, like you're going to meet one person a day maybe or one person every week or, but in the gym you sell, if, especially if it's high volume, five, 10, 15 people, you get a lot of no's, you get a lot of objections and you just hone your communication skills very, very quickly. When did you find out like you liked it and you were good at it? Uh, pretty much right away. I mean, men really took me under his wing and what I was first inspired by was obviously the commission checks. Right. right. But then what I was inspired by was just the, the, you know, the art of the, you know, the deal. Um, right. you know, it was like, to me, that's when really this concept of this, you know, the sport of business, the sport of sales kind of came in where you have a lead coming in and you're looking at him and it's like, all right, you know, it's you versus me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, and now granted that being said, you know, I was obviously, um, I had my ethical compass, right? Was was I really want to make sure these guys got what they were looking for, right? right? Like it wasn't hard selling, but I did the best I could, right? So as I walked them around, I toured them, I would look at all the different, you know, nifty things I could to try and, uh, you know, position the gym to be something they wanted to be a part of. And I do think at a young age, learning how to talk to people from all different backgrounds, all different ages, all different ethnic backgrounds was probably the most rewarding experience of my life because it really taught me how to interact and how to listen to what people wanted, listen to what people wanted, and then either we had it or we didn't, and most of the time, hopefully we did. Um, you know, which also then, you know, this conversation kind of drove me to find CrossFit, to find group style, um, community-based fitness, because what was happening to me was I was selling a lot of gym memberships, making good money, and what I found was was just this sense of um, hollowness when I would tell someone that they would come in and, and lose weight and get in better shape, but then I would see them a month or two later and they'd be gone. They wouldn't, the retention was bad. And what was happening was, you know, again, I was, I was making good money, but it left me feeling empty. You know, I'd go home and it, and yeah, sure. The art of the deal was great and I loved sales, but at the same time I wanted to sell something that I really believed in. Right. And so when I found CrossFit, when I found this group style training with a coach and a community, it, it really, took it to the next level because I felt like the results were much better because you had someone supporting you. You had a group environment that kind of encouraged you to work harder. And that's why I chose when I graduated from college to pursue opening up a you know community-based functional style gym versus a conventional gym, which I had looked at um, on the road, right? I, I had looked at opening up a regular gym, but we chose to go the other direction. Now, not to, not to mention the difference in cost. Like a big gym, a big box gym is, you know, the investment's yeah. massive. Yeah, it's a million. Yeah. I mean, I, I all money aside, um, because I had the current owner of Milpitas Fitness and I were going to go in on partners on, on, a, on a conventional gym, right? But I think that, yes, money and the, uh, the upfront cost and the barrier to entry was huge on a conventional gym. And the barrier to entry on a CrossFit style gym is very low, which is amazing and, and detrimental at the same time, which we could talk about. But um, that was another reason for it. But the primary reason was I really believed in the product, which the passion I have for this group style training, I think was a was a big um, reason why we've been successful in, in, in growing. What where where were you at in your life at the time when I, I told you before we got on these mics that we had actually met and I'd seen you before because we have a mutual friend, Austin. And I watched you compete in the parking lot at Milpitas. Yeah, where 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 are you at in your life? I don't even remember what that was. It was a long time ago. I know. that. Yeah, I mean, I was in I was in college for sure. Okay, and I was probably you know a senior in college, 
maybe a junior, senior, probably getting ready to graduate. And this is before the games, right? This before thing. the games, this is before um, I opened up our, our a gym. So what happened is I graduated from college in 2008 in like June, July, 2008. I graduated from San Clair. Um, took me a couple of tries, but I finally got in. Graduated at the same time as my wife. And uh, when we graduated, um, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, right? So I, I, I interviewed for different jobs. It just didn't feel right. And, and finally, I decided to open up a gym. And so I signed a lease. And then I ended up winning the CrossFit Games like all in the same week. Oh, and so, oh you wow. couldn't ask for better publicity for a new special y- CrossFit y- gym. Yeah. So I mean, at the time, right, winning the Games is right here in our backyard, right? It's, it was in the, you know, Watsonville, you know, that area. So winning that, signing a lease, graduating college, you know, I had just proposed to my wife. It was a, it was a busy time. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a like an orgasm did you, of did things. You, yeah. Did you succeed right away with your gym or was it a struggle starting off? So when we opened the gym, you know, I, I kind of opened it uh, with a, with a foundation of skills that I think really, really helped me because I loved, I loved CrossFit, right? I loved the group aspect, et cetera. But I also had a set of business skills that I had been developing for the last four years. And I learned every day from the owner of the gym, you know, him and I would get on the elliptical at night and I would just learn from him, learn, 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 just listen about different, different ways of different problems that he had. And what I did was I took that business knowledge that he shared with me. And then I took the passion that I learned from CrossFit and Austin and others, and then I combined them for our business. So I signed a six month lease on a thousand square foot space, uh, 1500 actually. And I signed a six month, le- six month lease. Cause I just told myself either a, I'm going to be bankrupt. Right. And I'm, you know, going to, whatever, or B, I'm going to be so successful that we need to expand out of here. And obviously option A was not an option. Okay. Right. And so we, we, we pushed and, and within six months, you know, we had a hundred members doing well in that location. That's a lot of people in a thousand square feet. Yeah. And then we ended up expanding and you know, that's kind of next step, next step. Typical entrepreneur, jump out the plane and then build your parachute on the way down. Right? That's it. You know, <laughs> I mean, you got to be all in. And for me, it was good timing. You know, my, my, my girlfriend and I at the time, our fiance and I, you know, we were fortunate enough to be um, living in a situation where my expenses were minimal. Right. And, you know, I, I had, I had great support from my family and just went out there and did it. Now they, they say like true growth really happens when we have our, our major failures and setbacks. And it sounds like you've had a lot of success out the gates. What are some of the things that that set you back or that you failed at during this whole time? I mean, I think with the gym, you know, learning how to manage people, learning. I mean, I think some of the problems kind of happen later. So, you know, obviously outside the gym life, I invest in a different things that I've learned a lot from, right? I invested in this thing called Batter Blaster, which was like this pancake in a can at the time. <laughs> I invested right. like five grand for a young kid. I lost it. That sucked. Started a clothing company, wasn't qualified to do so. Lost that. That sucked. Um, different stuff like that. But but primarily when we opened the gym, we were pretty successful, but it was a lot of work. You know, I, I ended up falling asleep on the on the floor multiple times. Um, you can get there early, you stay there late and you just, you're on their hustle. And what's, what was cool about sales and what's cool about business is I totally relate to both is the work you put in is a direct byproduct of what you get out of it. Right. And that's what I think I fell in love with sales the most. If you came in, if you got on the phone right back in the day, there was no self, you know, you had the, you had the, you know, phone on the, you know, every day I go through a list, boom, Hey, Hey, this is Jason Cleveland with, you know, da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah. and you know, um, you were in charge of your own paycheck and the same thing kind of applied with business, right? I was in charge of my success or failure. And so we, we generally performed well. Um, as we grew, I started to learn a few things. And a couple of years ago, we, we brought on, um, uh, not only, you know, <clears throat> you know, my, a, a best friend from years back, but also someone who could come in and, and help us with the management side. What well, what I learned was I wasn't the best manager. I, I just kind of figured people would just kind of figure it out. And people want to be having some guidance and direction. I wasn't offering that. And so that's something we've learned the hard way and a couple other things too. But I think hiring good people has helped us with that. Now, where mm-hmm. did you get this uh, this drive? Where did you get this ambition? Is it from your upbringing? How are your parents or how were you raised? So my dad's an engineer, works for the city of San Jose. He's awesome. Uh, came from Iran uh, mm-hmm. with nothing when he was younger. Um, that's 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 you know interesting. My, my mom moved here from Rhode Island. Um, she works at the San Clay University, which is cool. And I think at a young age, I started being influenced by certain people. You know, my grandma and grandpa, during the revolution in Iran, my grandma and grandpa were basically forced out of the country and they came here with nothing. And my father was already here, like a, two years earlier to go to school, but they came here with nothing. And I remember at an early age, just um, showing up at their dry cleaning business. 
And my, my grandma and grandpa at the time must have been, I don't know, maybe maybe 70s, 60s, 70s. I, I can't remember. But I mean, they're there doing a dry clean business. And I don't know if you've ever been into a dry clean business. I mean, it's not the easiest work, right? It's a nasty chemicals, this and that. And, you know, you've seen that from a young age, you kind of put in place like, man, this, this, you know, we got to grind. And then obviously once I got a little bit older and I was introduced to Min and Joe and the guys at Milpitas on the fitness at the age of, you know, 15, that was a very influential time in my life. Right. Um, and so that's probably where I learned hard work. You know, like they never, they never tried to, they never tried to encourage me to hack anything ever. Like it was just, Hey, look, we're going to do it one way and one way only. You're going to grab this stack of a hundred contracts. You're going to call every one of them every single day. There's no hack. There's no secret system. Just get on the phone and make some calls. Reps. Reps. Yeah. Get your reps in. That's it. All right. Now, at the moment, now you have a large, you have what, 20 locations? Yeah. You were talking about going over to Asia to set yours up, or you've got a few over there? Yeah. How we, are they receiving fitness over there, or receiving the CrossFit brand over there? Or So so those locations are not CrossFit. They're, um, they're, they're group style functional fitness classes with a varying degrees of, of, duration. Um, we also have yoga and they, they receive well. Those are in corporate environments. So our business, NC Fit, is separated 50-50 from revenue and potentially even locations between uh, corporate and uh, commercial or open to the public. Explain the difference between the two. So uh, open to the public, we have um, five locations that we solely own and operate. We lease. We have some here in the Bay Area and we have one in Cabo, Mexico. We also have two locations inside the Bay Club, which are inside conventional gyms that we operate right? Those are our locations. That's mm-hmm. seven. And then those are our open to the public locations. Our other ones are corporate sites with companies like Western Digital, GoPro, Silver Spring Networks. We manage their fitness inside their companies, mm-hmm. um, specifically for Western Digital on a global scale. And so that brought me, you know, years ago to all kinds of countries. So we, I go on tours all the time to Asia where we have locations in Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia. I mean, Japan, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's awesome. That's fucking. Wild. Were you awesome. always uh, were you always an athlete or into fitness uh, at this point? Was it just something that was besides working in fitness? Was it a passion of yours to work out as well? Yeah, it was definitely a passion to work out. You know, I I, I played football and I threw the shot in high school. Um, maybe could have gone on to play football, but uh, because of a few reasons, we didn't. Um, I used to race BMX bikes when I was younger, and when I got out of high school, I um I got in a little bit of a little bit of like Muay Thai. I started cutting down weight. I was 260 in high school, pretty big. So Holy I started, cow. So yeah. I started cutting, cutting, cutting. And um, and then and then I kind of got into like the bodybuilder type thing. You know, never competed in a bodybuilding competition, but kind of got into the, you know, like aesthetic looks. And then I was introduced to kind of the CrossFit style and that's where I really fell in love with it. And so I trained that for a while and then obviously I won the games and then competed. Did you feel like you took to it right away? Like as soon as you started doing the movements and stuff? Yeah, for the most part, I mean, I took to it, but it was also just like the... I think it was just the grind that I fell in love with. You know, one of the things I like about uh, CrossFit in particular is just this concept of AMRAPs and and uh, uh, just four time workouts. We are really pushing against the clock, and uh, I believe there's a big carryover to kind of that mentality and how you treat your rest of your life, mm-hmm. right? I I um, I've created this philosophy that I, I have written down called AMRAP mentality, and um, well, I'll just tell you what it is. So <laughs> basically, you know, years ago. So I met my wife when we were 14. Um, we, you know, uh, we got married in 2009. Like like I was saying, we got engaged in 2008. We got married in 2009, a week after the CrossFit Games uh, in 2009. That was pretty interesting. Um, and so I got married. We The gym was growing and we had a, a daughter in 2010, right? And so, I know. 2008. You got to get it right. Dude. 11. <laughs> yeah. Come on, dad. <laughs> you, you, you know, what's odd about that is I say my daughter's birthday all the time because she's going through chemotherapy treatment and they always ask the birth date for 21, 11. Got it. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, I had, I, we had a daughter, uh, married business is growing. We start getting into corporate a little bit and I start asking myself, man, how am I going to balance being a good father, right? Being a good husband. Cause these are priorities for me in my life, but also competing at a high level in professional sport while growing a business. I'm like, how the hell are we going to do this? And you know, it, it was, it, it kind of like dawned on me one day, you know, I was walking with my kid, I was walking with my wife and, and daughter, we were going on a walk and I was just distracted thinking about competing, walking on my hands, thinking about what the competition was going to have. And I wasn't paying attention to my wife at all, right? But I was with them, but I wasn't really with them. And I wasn't present. I wasn't focused. Mm. 
And it was that day that like my wife's like, hey, you know, what do you think about this? And I'm like, what do you think about what? And I wasn't paying attention. She knew it, right? It was just like a big slap in the face to her. You know, like here I am with her, here I am with my kid and I'm not paying attention. Mm. So later on that night and just for the ongoing years, I started thinking about things as an AMRAP. And when you're an AMRAP, as many rounds or reps as possible, you wouldn't answer your phone, right? You wouldn't stop and talk to someone. When you're in it, a 10 minute AMRAP, you're in it, right? That's what you're doing. And that's the way I tried from that day forward, right? I slowly, this concept was created but basically I try and treat each facet of my life as an AMRAP, right? So right now, you know, I was on my phone before we started. Now you see me turn it over and I'm with you guys. Like mm-hmm. I'm not doing anything else, but with you guys, mm-hmm. right? Once we're done, I'll go switch gears to something else. And so the whole philosophy mm-hmm. is based on identify what you want to focus on, whether it be family, your fitness, your business, work hard at it, right? Whatever that is. And then switch gears. Is Where that does, actually in your schedule too? Have you been able to kind of put that together in uh, some kind of rituals like you follow? Like I'm, I'm here and I'm present at this time and then for yeah, sleep, like, it's this. Like think about like this morning, I took a 5 a.m. class, right? So I took a class at 5 a.m. That was my workout, right? Um, maybe I'll do something later, but for now, let's just say that's my workout time. During that hour, I'm not answering emails. I'm not answering calls. I'm just working out, right? After I'm done with that, then I switch gears on to work. And I try and segment the day that way. Mm-hmm. And so like after six o'clock, whatever that time that is, I go home. Once I'm home, I try and be present and focus with the family. And so the whole concept is this this evolution. I think about like riding a bike, right? You you have to focus to ride a bike. You have to pedal to ride a bike. And then based on the terrain or what you're doing, you switch gears, right? But you're still pedaling. You're still focused. It's not like it just changes. And then every now and then the, the, the kind of kicker to this AMRAP mentality Um, which I've been writing down a lot of thoughts on and hopefully one day we'll see a book come out on it is, is um, the reevaluation and the reevaluation I think is really important. You know, you identify your focuses today are going to be different than they are five years from now. Maybe you get married, maybe you have a kid, maybe something dramatic happens, you know? So for me that happened in, um, you know, in 2015, I I needed to switch gears. You know, I had a, I had a, I had another, I had a son, a daughter growing business. I couldn't go individual anymore. So I switched gears and went team at the CrossFit Games. And then the year after, when I was trying to decide if we we're going to compete again, my daughter got sick. And it was a very easy answer just to say, hey, we need to switch gears, right? Or we need to reevaluate and say, hey, look, competing is not on my list of priorities. Well, my priorities are this, this, this. And uh, that was the reevaluation. Where does this where does this level of self-awareness come from for you? Are you a big reader? Do you have a mentor? Are you religious? Where does the where does the self-awareness come I mean, from? I'd say all the above. I mean, I think, I think, you know, I try and read, I try and read. I try and listen to informational podcasts. I try and um, listen to mentors a lot, right? Like I sit down with people all the time and just listen, listen, listen. I want to educate myself as much as I can on different subjects. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, and then and then just being aware, you know, like I just, I don't want to look back and be like, man, I was an asshole. I, I could have been a better father. I could have been this. You know, as long as you ask yourself that on a regular basis, you know, like a lot of times I'm on a spin bike in my garage. I just say to myself, Am I doing the best I can to be a father, a husband, and a business owner and maintain my fitness? Am I doing the best I can? And if I'm not, then then just do better tomorrow. Like it's not a big deal. You know, that's so, it's really yeah. impressive because when you get to the level that you've reached uh, in like the games and things like that, and even your success in business, uh, the ego tends to to take over, mm-hmm. and the the level of awareness that you have to it's like not more do. imbalanced, right? Right, the extreme it's, of it. I mean, you have to know you're kind of rare, right? That that's not the most guys that are at your success level, both business and in sports, like that's something that uh, that most people struggle with. Do you ever find yourself battling with that? Do you have your moments of where you feel like you want to be cocky, or you feel like that, or do no. you have this humility to you that you've always kind of had? No, I mean, no, I'm just no. I, I think I just strive to just do as best I can. I think if anything, I don't want to be a hypocrite, if anything, right? I don't want to be a guy who says what I just said to you guys and, and then not the be able to deliver it, right? right? If anything, that's what keeps me up is like, hey man, am I really doing the best I can? Like, am I really being present and focused when I'm with my family? Am I? If not, I need to fix it tomorrow. Those are the lessons I learned from having children. I got two kids myself. And, totally. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you get some of those yourself from them? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like the lessons I yeah. learned. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, and then with my daughter getting sick, it's, it's transformed my mindset a lot. But now that happened in 2015, you said, or 2016, uh, six, six, 16, January, 
January 20th, uh, 2016. So uh, I don't know much about this. If you don't mind me asking uh, mm-hmm. questions about it, you have, you have you had two kids, so it's your daughter's your older, mm-hmm. oldest child. So she's six and a half. Six and a half. So this happens. Your business is obviously at that time, it's busy, growing. You got mm-hmm. lots of shit going on. You're competing. Like what happens? Like what goes through your mind at that point? How do you stay, I guess, strong or how do you stay Positive. above ground? Yeah. I mean, the whole the whole thing comes back to one of the reasons why I do want to put out a book called Amrap Mentality is because of the Amrap Mentality, because of that, that clarity, <clears throat> I was able to fully shift gears and fully focus on the family and what needed to get done. Um, I wrote an email that night at like three in the morning to our, to like the head of our staff, like our head staff, just like, Hey, look, if it doesn't have to do with getting my daughter, well, I have zero interest in talking about it effective immediately. This person's in, is, is in charge. Oh wow! And, uh, this might take a month. This might take six months. This might take a year, but I don't want to hear anything about anything unless it has to do with education on how I can get my daughter better. How, how long did that last? How long did that? Um, so uh, like the, like the full, like zero, yeah. zero, zero, a uh, couple weeks, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the person at the time, his name is Matt, who's running the company. He's also one of my best friends. So it was a little bit different because he would come <clears> to see me in the hospital and I would, I would, you know, we would be, if it wasn't like a heavy moment, like if, if things were like kind of calm ish, I would just be like, Hey man, like, what's the, are we, are we good? you would be like, we're good. I'd be like, all right, cool. So that's, that's pretty much the extent of it for a while. Wow. And then I got back in the swing of things. Now, talking about like the, not to switch gears too fast on you, but going into like the CrossFit games and stuff like that, what what is, uh, in your opinion, the, the greatest moment of, of CrossFit for you? Can you remember what that was? Yeah, I mean, there's been a few, right? I mean, obviously, uh, winning the CrossFit games is a big deal. Um, but at the time, it didn't really mean as much to me as, as um, you know, taking second and third. So I took second and 13. I took third in 2014, right? Um, those ones went meant more to me, mm. right? Because of the amount of workload you put in behind it, right? Um. So, you know, it's like, for example, if someone came in and gave you a check for a thousand dollars, like that'd be great. And like, you'd love it. But if you, you know, put in a bunch of hard work and I mean, maybe money isn't the best example here, but if you put in a bunch of hard work and then you saw the the reward for your hard work and you had put in so much time and effort, right? Um, it's like if someone gave you a PhD versus working for 10 years to get it and then you finally get it. It yeah. means more at the end because you put in all that sacrifice. Was it also that the level of competition had yeah. gone up dramatically? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you figure in 2008, you know, we had, I don't know, 300 competitors. In 2014, you have 300,000. Big, big difference. Wow. And so, you know, for me- so oh, they're that, animals now, man. You watch the competitions now and these are world-class, like- ridiculous level athletes. Yeah, 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 for sure. And so the last year I competed was in 15, right? And then uh, with Ava getting sick, it was an easy transition. But, you know, a lot of good memories of the games, right? I mean, you know, I, I specifically remember, you know, I, I tried to incorporate some positive self-talk and and um, and I, I think it was this one event in particular, it's called the Burden Run. And in this Burden Run, you would run a long way. Then you come in, you flip this thing called a pig down a down a, a football field. And it was heavy. It was, it was a heavy it was like a big tire flip only. It was called a pig. And then after that, you run with a log on your back for a while. And then you get into the stadium. And in the stadium, you then pull a sled for like, I don't know, 150 yards. Not that far. And I just remember thinking to myself the night before we saw the event. I was like, man, it would be so cool to go into that stadium being first and knowing that you're going to win. Right. And that's exactly what happened. That was a really cool moment for me is that I made it in with such a lead that I pulled the sled halfway. I just stood there for a while and just kind of took it in. Uh-huh. I knew I was going to win. Dope. And there was no benefit to to going faster. As long, mm-hmm. A win is a win, right, yeah. at that point. Mm-hmm. And so it was events like that. And like I also won this half marathon row that was really cool where you know you're going to win before you win. It's kind of cool because most of the time if you win or do well, it happens instantly. Whereas these ones, you kind of had time to kind of let it sink in for a little bit. Now, being a, a smart business individual like you are, and owing a lot of your success to your hard work, but then affiliating and working with CrossFit. Do you have any criticisms of CrossFit, the organization? I mean, you know, just like you would typically have. I mean, CrossFit's had a lot of growth. And um, just like anything with a lot of growth, you're going to have a few bad apples in, in, in everything, right? And that goes from affiliate owners and gyms to, you know, um, the company. I mean, it's just naturally going to happen with the type of growth they have. And so I don't think there's anything that stands out that's so odd outside of like business norms. I just think with the, with the low barrier to entry and the high learning curve, you know, by design, it was going to be 
you know, there was going to be a time where it's not going to continue to exponentially grow. And I think that's what you found now is that it's kind of leveled out. If anything, it's gone back down. And the reason for it is you have some owners who got into it who frankly weren't qualified and that's just business. How many do you that are still thriving right now that were started when you started? Is there very many? I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, I there are, there are, I mean, there are a lot of gyms that are that are doing well, but it depends what you mean by thriving, right? There's, there's gyms that are still there. Are they thriving? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, cause it depends what you mean by that. Cause to me, there's a lot of gyms out there that I would close down. Mm-hmm. Meaning if I was making 40, $50,000 a year, right. And I had all the risk and liability and I had a hundred members in our gym, I would probably shut the gym down and go find a job and work somewhere else because it isn't worth the risk and liability for me. Right. Yeah. For, for that amount of money. Right. right. And so I think there's a lot of owners that generally make, you know, an income of, and it, or I'll rephrase it. If you're, if you're making an income that allows you to kind of live paycheck to paycheck, you're doing okay. You love what you do. I think there's a way to love what you do and not take on all that risk and liability. Right, That's right. a better way to describe it. Yeah. You it. could still be into fitness and classes and not have to be responsible for everything. Right. Right. I yeah. mean, a lot of, a lot of owners, you know, it's challenging because they've signed personally guaranteed leases on spaces and you know, if they can't pay the bills and, and if something happens, I mean, that's, that's tough. You know, you can't just bankrupt a company. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about a personal liability you're taking on. Well, now, earlier you talked about like uh, the detriments of some of these warehouse gyms are, are going in that direction. Did you want to describe that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I just think that's, there's, there's three threats to that kind of, that kind of philosophy, right? One is if you have the same brand throughout multiple locations, you're always going to be synced up with that brand, right? So, you know, if, if it's, you know, uh, you have a Ruka shirt on, right? If it's Ruka and then somebody else called Ruka Sport and Ruka this and Ruka that, they're all they're all connected to each other. Even if they aren't the same, even if they aren't owned and operated by the same people, they're connected because of this one, you know, characteristic. Right. So I think when you have CrossFit this, CrossFit this, CrossFit this, everybody looks at it as like they're owned by the same people, the the outside eye, right? To most people that- Right, to, to someone our, doesn't know better, right? Yeah, to people that know better, it's different, right? But, you know- uh, And so I think that makes a big difference um, when that's a big threat, because if you are, if you're putting out a better product, then, you know, other people with a similar name might bring down your product. That's a problem, right? And then obviously you have, you know, (coughs) conventional gyms that are wising up to this functional fitness concept, right? And I think they're starting to put in turf. They're starting to do different types of things because they're recognizing that people want these multi-joint, you know, compound movements, um, barbell complex is out of sagittal plane finally. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I think that makes a, that makes a difference, right? Because these are, are instantly becoming competitors to that, to that space. And then lastly, obviously you have people at home that could just outfit their gym, outfit their garage for, you know, $2,000, um, for with the, with the, with gear. And so if you're not providing a phenomenal product, it's going to be tough for them to justify going to your space and paying that kind of premium. Mm-hmm. It's always about the people. Yep. That's how fitness works. I mean, mm-hmm. we experienced that running, you know, big box gyms where you could walk into a gym and if you were a good manager within a week or two, you could you could produce numbers at that club and never seen without changing a single piece of equipment. And I think a lot of people in fitness forget that. They think it's all about the equipment, location. Those are important too, but they think that's it. Like, oh, I'm going to open the place up and I'm going to succeed. And CrossFit had this explosion of growth and it doesn't, it's no, it's, it reminds me a lot of the other things that we've seen in fitness that have exploded. And then you get people who enter it who have no business running a gym, who have no sales experience. Well, what, are, no. the, what, yeah. are, the, what are the numbers look like, Jay? Like, what would you say is uh, the low end someone makes having a box, the high end, and then probably what the average is and how many people are probably in that range, you think? So I'll share this information from, we've had about maybe 400 affiliates come through what we call Box of Business, which is a seminar my buddy and I do for not-for-profit. I should clarify that it's for charity for pediatric cancer. Oh, that's cool. And that's so, fantastic. so, uh, 400. So out of the 400, right. Which mm-hmm. we do all these randomly. We don't, we don't, this is not a business for us. It's just, we do it for fun. Um, I would say on average at the high end, at the high end, now there's, there's anomalies and there's exceptions to right. this, right. But at the high end, you know, an owner, if it's owner operated, right. Makes a big difference. Yep. If it's owner operated, you know, 100, 150 of its owner operated, mm-hmm. right? Maybe 150 that we've seen, right? Now if it's now if it's is that profit or that's gross? That's that's profit. Okay. Right? That, that's their Excellent. that's their that's their take home, right? Yeah. yeah, 150, right? If it's not owner operated, right, those numbers drop down a little bit because you have to pay an operator, right? So maybe you're looking at, you know, 
seventy thousand for the operator and another, you know, maybe a hundred they could take home if it's really being ran well. The the you know the owner could mm-hmm. right. And on the low end, obviously you have zeros, right? And then and then somewhere in the middle, I'd say on average you're somewhere around two to three thousand dollars a month for the take home income for most, um, you know, on average yeah. for a lot of the owners we've seen. Right now, that's that's just what we've seen. Now, again, there's exceptions to all of these rules, right? There's people that are killing it, you know, making hundreds of thousands, but there's a lot of people that aren't. What do you think it, now? Do you see anything common happening with the one the anomalies, like the guys that are what makes them that? Are good? They, yeah, are they reinventing things? Are they maybe getting digital too? Or are they what are they, are they doing other things? Or are they just running their box that fucking well? No, I mean, I think they're running their box well. They have great coaches, right? It starts with the product on the floor. I think they have multiple locations, right? Um, and I think that they uh, diversify their offerings a little bit. So they're not just traditional CrossFit. They have diversification of offerings to things like, you know, more, less complex, right? A little bit lower barrier to entry. So instead of doing things like rope climbs and, and snatches, they have another alternative offering called whatever, fit class, that is less complex. What do you think the biggest mistake that the ones that aren't very successful make? What's the most common mistake you see? I think uh, not treating it like a business, mm. for sure. I think they they open their doors and they think people are just going to walk in. They're not. This isn't 2008 or nine when the you know the, the, there's a lot of competition out there, and you need to make sure that your product on the floor is phenomenal and that your facility is at least clean. And uh, and, and I also think like if you want to just offer traditional CrossFit, that's perfectly fine. Just be aware that by doing so, you're you are going to adhere to a specific demographic and that's fine. It's the same thing like jujitsu. I love jujitsu, right? But I would never open up a jujitsu studio because your, 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 your specific one demographic, and there's only so many people that want to roll around and that's fine, but just be aware of it. Right. So how do you diversify? So if you're not just a jujitsu or not just a CrossFit, what are the other ways that you, you mold your NC fit to be well, kind of different? Like? Well, I mean, here's a great example. Think about MMA. A lot of these gyms, when MMA was getting popular, they popped up, right? I saw it personally. You guys probably saw it. But what MMA schools realized really early on is not that many people want to get kicked in the face, right? <laughs> you know? It's true. It, yeah. It's true. That's not even yeah, a debate. That sucks. <laughs> and, and so what happens is this is a perfect example for the CrossFit space. Not everybody wants to snatch and do rope climbs. And that's fine. Just like not everybody wants to spar, right? It's not a big deal. But what you need to do then is you need to start looking at your business and say, how do I diversify this without getting outside my core competency, mm-hmm. right? So if your core competency hypothetically is fighting, let's just use that as an example. What could you do? Cardio kickboxing class, right? Still similar. You're just breaking it down so that the barrier to entry is lower. Mm-hmm. And that's how a lot of these gyms have been super successful in the MMA world. They have cardio kickboxing, these cardio classes that make all the money. And then they have the athletes that might draw people in or whatever, but it's not the bulk of their money. It's the same thing goes for CrossFit gyms. Yeah. The competitors do not pay their bills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always the case. Yeah. If anything, you know, it goes the other way. <laughs> yeah. That's Give very me all true. The free stuff. Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think that's why we're seeing the popularity of, uh, of other fitness organizations like Orange Theory. Yeah. Kind of following along the footsteps and, you know, doing a, a different version or a, more it's easier type of version right like you get your treadmills your rowers and it's not crossfit but it's similar yeah well what happened is you had historically right you had 24-hour fitness low barrier to entry low pro price point um generally in my opinion a lower lower level of results for the majority of people who of participate in yeah, it no, it's high right? volume high, 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 high volume high volume right <clears throat> then you had crossfit come in high complexity high price point high coaching great results if you if you assumed you were ready for that right, right? but it's it's non-debatable that the results are phenomenal it, it, you know assuming you have the right coaching the right environment everything what happened is it created this huge middle ground where companies like berries companies like f45 companies like orange theory have really been able to mop, monopolize that middle market where it's not as expensive hypothetically not as boutique as crossfit not as complex but um more complex than Twitter. What's your thoughts on that? How do you, how do you think it's going to change the landscape of all these clubs and CrossFits? Do you think it's going to force certain CrossFits to evolve and adapt? Yeah, I think I think certain ones will evolve and adapt and other ones won't and those ones will be fine. They're going to have, you know, their 100, 150, 200 members and they're going to do great And but that but that's where they're going to be, right? They're going to be like the jiu-jitsu studio that I go to, right? 150, 200 students, it's all good. 
then there's going to be others who are going to diversify their offering and do different types of things. And they're going to grow past that amount. With the amount of gyms that you have that you keep opening up, have you been faced with uh, the idea of maybe having to close one down? Have you thought like, ah, this one's just not pulling its weight and it's more stress for me or do they all kill it? That's a good question. No, um, we have not thought about, we, we've, we actually, yes, we have shut down a gym. I oh. shouldn't say that. I should say that we had one on Saratoga Avenue. Um, it was an old, uh, like racquetball court, a giant one near, um, the casino over there. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know right. Mm -hmm. And we shut it down, not because it wasn't profitable, but because it didn't represent our brand well. So what happened is as we've grown and we've expanded we've, and we've evolved, some of our locations haven't evolved with them, with mm -hmm. that, right? That was the gym that got us to where we were, but not where we wanted to go. And so we had to go ahead and uh, shut it down because we couldn't get a long-term lease on it and it didn't reflect our brand. So we shut it down and we opened up another space somewhere else. Oh, well, talk, let's talk about that. What was yeah. that like for you? I mean, you had probably let, had to fire someone or tell them, sorry, no more. I mean, what I that mean some of the friend desk and staff had to leave, but I mean, what, because we had opened up, so we shut down one and we, we replaced it with basically two more. And so no one really lost their job, oh, okay. but they were different gyms in diff a little bit different areas. And so, um, but we had to shut it down because we were on a month month lease, can't be on a month month lease. And we couldn't make investments in the property because we're on the month month lease. I mean, I'm not going to, we're not going to spend a hundred grand to fix the place up if we, we don't know if we're going to be there three months from now. Yeah. And so we had an obligation to our staff and our members to shut it down and, and reevaluate. And some people were pretty upset about it, but What's the turnover like? Is do trainers get turned over? Like, because I know in the big box world, I mean, you were typically turn, turnovers. Horrible. Turnover trainers like crazy. Is it different? What do you? Um, it's it's it used to be like our coaches were with us forever. We have one coach who's currently still with us for after nine years, right? Wow. Um, but we're seeing it become more of a uh, as the Bay Area gets more expensive and things of that nature. It is becoming more of a part time um, coaching position, and then they have other things they're doing. Um, but our locations each have like a manager and a head coach. So they're full time with us, benefits, all that kind of stuff. And then several others will be like part time. And so the turnovers, it's not bad, but yeah. it can always get better. Yeah. Is it, now, is that something that you have your hands on? Are you going in and kind of, or do you have guys that, and girls that are managing that for you? Are you going in and actually training and developing some of these coaches and having to fire them? Do you have to deal with that very much? No, no, we have, <laughs> we, have a, we have a group of people to help with that. I'm pretty, I'm pretty non-confrontational. I was just going to say, you were saying it like, you know, that's, that's cool. I don't want to do that. Yeah. yeah. That. Hey, you, you go, you got that, bro. It's all you. <laughs> have you had, now, when did you find out you don't like doing that? Have you had a situation where you had yeah, to do that? I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, we've let people go well, and fuck it i want to hear one i know there had to have been a heart you had yeah. to have had a heart because i i remember the first time i had to let go i was only 20 god i was only 21 years old and at that time like you i i didn't start at front desk but i started as a trainer and then i got promoted within the same club so it was like overnight mm -hmm. i was your peer right and then now i'm your boss yeah, not to mention a tough situation not yeah. to mention i'm 21 everybody else is older yeah, i'm the baby 25 30 yes. whatever and yeah. now I, and then it got to a point where i'm not out partying with you i'm not doing anymore i'm the boss now we have to run this club and i remember watching my staff kind of get poisoned and it started with one or two bad apples and i let it fester for like 6 months before i had this kind of like half my staff were just a pain in the ass and i remember that feeling of having to let let go and i fired fucking five trainers on the same day and I remember how hard that was for me. It was a challenge. Did you, do you remember ever? Yeah, I mean, it's still, uh, you know, that's not an easy thing to ever let anybody go. And I think what I'm learning as, as, a, as we evolve as a business is that, you know, if you, if you keep people on the team, and they're not the right people for the team. Like the way we like to say it now is like, we're a team, right? We're a team. But as a team, there's a responsibility to the team to put the best players on it. And if you're not the best player on the team, if you're not pulling your weight as a teammate, we got to let go. And so we look at it as a team, not a family in that sense, right? Where family, you're going to love them forever, right? And you'll keep them on the team. You'll keep them in the family forever, right? right? right. <laughs> but a team, right? Naturally, if we all want to be able to pay our children's college funds, if we all want to grow and develop. We need people on the team who are pulling their weight and who really want to grow with the team and, and, and do their job well. So we've had to let some people go and, and I, I don't really do any of it, but I mean, I've had a few things. <laughs> I mean, obviously I've let people go and it's, but most of the time, it's more of like a, it's just an awkward conversation. <laughs> like, but, but I, we always live by the rule. It's a very simple rule. 
no one should ever be blindsided when they're let go, right? Unless they should they, know. They should know, especially like mm-hmm. if, I mean, it, they should know. You should give them, we have an obligation as a business to make sure that we set up, you know, performance improvement plans and things like that so that when we do let them go, it should never come as a surprise. And that's more of an ethical thing. And then also from an HR perspective, that kind of helps too. You got to be safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 First had... time I fired someone, they cried. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. 19 years it's old. Brutal. Yeah, 19 years old. Yeah. Guy showed up late, two weekends in a row. I had to walk in and had to fire him right there. And he had a family and everything. And I thought to myself, like, you know what? I'm doing you a favor too, dude. Yeah. Because this, you, can't, you, can't, you can't support your family if you keep showing up late, two hours of work. Well, yeah, you're teaching them. It's just work ethic. It's like, yeah. dude, show up on time. <laughs> <You're> responsible. <laughs> yeah. What, having this responsibility, this many clubs, what are the thing what are the things you like the most about it and what are the things you like the least about it? Uh the most about it is obviously the amount of people we can impact, right? right? And being inside conventional gyms, being in Asia, different places, we get to define what fitness is for some of these people. That's like cool. in China, mm-hmm. like our location in Shenzhen, China, they've never heard of functional fitness, right? Mm-hmm. And they'll be, you know, they'll be sitting outside. I'll, I'll never forget the first class I ever taught there. We had this new location at Western Digital and the, and the employees were out front. Like a lot of them are out there smoking, right? Just smoking, smoking, smoking. So they come in, they take a class and they didn't know what really hit them, right? I, I kept it pretty casual. And then after that, they, 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 what's happened now is the culture has shifted. And now they, they don't smoke anymore before class, only, only after <laughs> yeah. class. Yeah. Yeah. And hey, that's that's better than nothing. Right? Yeah, right, right. You're but, stepping in the right direction. Right, but we're defining what fitness is for them, right? We're letting them know that, hey, fitness is functional. Let's talk about squats and, and presses and lifts versus um, you know specific machine-based, right? Mm-hmm. So it's cool to see that. And it's cool to teach them about work ethic and things like that. So that's the, my favorite thing about the business is kind of the scope we work on and the amount of people we can impact. You know, our business is very simple the way it works you know, I've decided I wanted to pursue what I love for a living and I'm super grateful for everybody that's been a part of it. Then we want to offer that opportunity as many coaches as we can, right? Or, or people. And then those people then touch our members, right? They impact the members' lives. And then the members' lives then support the greater community by doing philanthropic stuff, right? So we do blood drives, we do large donations. We, we are really invested in the, the bigger picture. And so that's my favorite thing about the business, right? Is, is that negatives? I mean, obviously, you know, that the larger the scope, the more problems you have. Um, I do think that we're, we're probably less stressed today than I was a couple of years ago because we've, we've hired really good people. Um, there comes a time in business where you're like in this like influx where you're kind of taking on all the, you, you're, as you grow, you got to know when to bring on good people because it'll really help your stress. And that's, we've been fortunate in that sense. Yeah. Mm. Did you start the philanthropic work after your daughter got sick or was this something you've always... So as a company, we've always supported different things. Um, we used to support the Navy SEAL Foundation, do a lot of stuff with them, um, do like Memorial Day events. We've done um, low-income schools. We've we've done donations for fitness centers at low-income schools, I should say. But then once Ava got sick, we uh, we really like that's a that's a core value of mine right. forever. Um, we will one hundred percent always continue to support like an annual blood drive that's 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 really large, and we do it uh, nationwide at different CrossFit gyms. And then we do different philanthropic events throughout the duration of the year to raise money for a group called Nigu or Jesse Reese Foundation. So we can give uh, families, um, you know, like a mini make a wishes is what we do. I, I want to ask you about, uh, and this might be kind of hard, but I'm, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit, is if we're looking at all the CrossFit athletes out there that you know, who is, who's your favorite athlete besides yourself, obviously, <laughs> right? Who's your favorite athlete and why? And then who's your least favorite athlete and why? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, favorite. I mean, I, I, a lot of these guys I've known for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that's why I think you're a great person to ask because I think you've been around a long time. You know a lot of guys, and I know and I know guys that aren't all the best of guys that are involved in it. I know there's a lot of really great guys, so I'm, I'm I mean, fishing on you right now. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll use Ben Smith as an example only because he doesn't get much press because he's more of a low key kind of guy. Mm-hmm. The guy's been to the games nine times. He's been in the top five a ton of times, been on the podium a ton of times. I mean, he's legit as you get. Um, and he's just a really good, humble dude. So Ben Smith's one of my favorites. I mean, obviously I have others that, that are, I like a lot. Uh Um, and, uh, you know, Matt Frazier is obviously doing amazing things recently. I'm I'm actually going to see him and Rich next week. So that'd be pretty cool. You know, someone I don't like when I, when I, so I got out of the sport in 2015 and the sport naturally kind of like uh, s- like sifted through the, the crappy guys. Um, back then, no one got into it for the money or the fame. 
now it might be a little bit different. Like two years makes a big difference. When I got into it and I won the games, I won 1800 bucks. My first sponsorship was $1,000, right? Now the game has changed a lot and sponsorships are massive and the money you win is big. What is it now? What's the money now that you can win? Um, I mean, three, you know, 250, 300 from the What from a the sport. huge difference. 1800 to 300,000. Yeah, when Holy I took- Holy shit, when I, I did took, not know that. When I took second and third, I made, sig- I, I think I made, I don't know, a hundred grand when I took third. I, <laughs> That's I, great. But whatever That's crazy it was. thing you won yeah. it and you got 1800 bucks. Yeah. And then, yeah. Wow. And so um, the sports change. And so what happens is you have people who come in sometimes for inspired by, uh, you know, um, money and fame. Oh, can now do you feel like you can see that? Can you guys sense that? What's the difference between them and the guys that are motivated differently? Well, the guys who are, who back in the day, they start off as coaches, right? And so what's happening is a lot of these athletes, they don't coach people. And so it's it's a different dynamic where the guys in the beginning got into it, had alternative sources of income because they didn't have any money, but they couldn't make it through just the sport. And they were coaches and they had a community around them to kind of rally them. Now it's like these guys are being treated as, you know, professional athletes in a different in a different light. Now, not all people are going out there for the money to win. They want to just compete, right? But it just changes the landscape a little bit. And I, I can't really speak to anybody being a, a jerk. I I Oh, you, you know, so dodged around that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when these Dance mics turn off. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> How about Brandon? We can talk about Brandon. I, I see like parallels between like the MMA with like tap out and how that sort of lost favor in that community. Is there any sort of uh, brands or things that have gone through CrossFit well, that I mean, have lost favor? I mean, Life is RX used to be one. I don't I don't know where that one is. Um, there's a few other brands, right? I mean, uh, that, that kind of came in, but they might have shifted to a different industry. I, I don't know. I, I don't keep up with all of them. Okay. You know? Uh, I'm what, always just curious because the what, culture is always changing. So culture always yeah. shifts. Yeah. What brands and companies do excite you that are involved in CrossFit right now? I mean, Rogue obviously puts out great equipment, right? right? Um, Reebok is 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 a synonymous brand with 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 CrossFit. I mean, I think they have they have competitors in the space now, but Reebok's done a good job kind of solidifying themselves with the Reebok CrossFit Games. Um, you know, I think uh, Progenix is a supplement company. I think they do a good job. I think that let's see what other. You know, RPM, the jump rope company, I think they put out a phenomenal jump rope. Other brands in the space that kind of are exciting. Um, uh, you know, there's so many, right? Yeah. There's so, so many. I mean, you got from 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 5'11 to, you know, a lot of people have came in. And a lot of these sponsors, though, they're going to find out that it's not as easy to, um, you know, the, the CrossFit consumer is a smart consumer. And it's also being very saturated in the marketplace. There's mm-hmm. a lot of t-shirt companies. And... I think they're going to find very quickly that it's challenging. Do, do you not affiliate yourself with any of these companies right now, or are you affiliated with a lot of these? So companies? I'm, I'm technically, so I have sponsorship agreements with um, Rogue, Reebok, Progenix, and actually all the ones I mentioned, right? Um, but other brands, I like other brands like Five Eleven, and um, pretty much there's there's other ones out there that I'll stop by their booth and say what's up, yeah. but. Um, I'm not sponsored or anything like that. But yeah. Where do you see uh, the future of CrossFit growth? Because it seems like it it kind of plateaued a little bit, right? Like you're getting a lot of the the cream rising to the top and yep. the battles dropping off. Where do you see them going from there? Like the affiliates, you mean? Yeah, or just the business of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the business of it, it's going to, I think you're going to still have people who are going to affiliate. I think that, because uh, they want to use the name, and I think internationally it's going to grow. I think internationally. I think That's where the big market is now, Yeah, right? I think domestically it's probably hit its peak and there's saturation. I think domestically it's, it's going to continue to grow in China and different areas, Brazil, uh, Australia. Oh, you know what I wanted to ask you? Talking about, we were just talking about Rogue, take you back there again. They uh, they just recently released a, a fire pit. What the yeah. fuck is that all about? Oh, they do <laughs> partnerships with different people. Like Why? That. What is the, is I mean- a, I, I I don't know. I mean, they they I know that. So, so there's um, nothing about the culture of CrossFit. Yeah, I thought maybe I thought that was ma- no. I mean, I know Bill and Katie. They like the they like barbecuing and different different things. And <laughs> yeah. So they probably just decided to make one. Um, I, I don't I don't have a. That's reason. what happens yeah. when you're so your random. Company. Yeah, we, yeah. I was like, huh? we saw it not too long ago. Well, they also make furniture, right? So our entire office. Oh, I what? Has, I did not know that. Yeah, our entire office like is nothing ergonomical but, or what? You yeah, can do box jumps on it's it. It's all Rogue Supply Co. <laughs> so it's all Rogue. All of our furniture, all of our stand up desks, all of them are Rogue Supply Co. And they're awesome. Oh, oh that's cool. wow. That's wow. pretty fascinating. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of like that rustic look. How long ago did they move into that space? How um, they... Like probably a year ago. 
Oh wow! Yeah. Let's look. Let's look them up. We need some furniture. Yeah, no, yeah. They're, they're they're definitely making moves for sure, man. Matt, you were talking about out there how you wanted to enter into the digital world more of fitness. Uh, mm-hmm. What is that looking like for you? What do you think about doing? I mean, I think the the digital world is just a space that I think anybody with any type of social platform should should look into, right? And I think we're in a unique position because we've proven certain things in the brick and mortar, and now we could take some of those proven concepts that we use at our gym and try and share them with other people. You know, for example, we have three uh, offerings, right? We have a 30-minute offering, a 45-minute offering, and a 60-minute offering CrossFit at our gyms. And we found success with those. And I'd like to be able to share that with other gym owners. I like to share it with other people. And so we're looking at ways to do that. Now, the biggest thing we're going to use media for is, is sharing with our current coaches, right? Is how do we put the best product on the floor globally? One of the easiest ways is to produce content, share that with our coaches so that they have a better idea of what we're looking for, for their for the way they execute their class. That's a great point because like, how do you keep uniformity or, you know, because you've got a lot of locations. Like, how do you keep them so that people know they're going to one of your places and yeah. not just another another box? When we have session plans and programming that are distributed globally, right, and they're held accountable for those, right? This is a program. This is the way we want you to brief it. This is the way we want you to warm up, right? We give the warm up time. But I think adding videos to that will just take it to the next step. Uh, and then obviously we have coaching development, right? So we travel out to these different places. We we perform coaching development and we assess. Hmm. And then obviously domestically, we could do that really easily because we have a lot of locations around here. What do, you, what do you think has been the, the best business advice that you've ever received from somebody? Yeah, uh, best business advice. I mean, I think there's a few things. I was actually just with someone this morning who was telling me, you know, it's, you got to say no to a lot more things, right? You're just telling me you got to learn to say no. And I think, I think identifying where you want to focus and pursuing that and then anything else that's not involved in that, just avoid it. You know, as a gym, we started incorporating spin and Pilates just to see it, check it out. Right. And I think what we recognized early on is that we're a functional fitness company on a commercial side. Now for corporate, we also incorporate yoga. But we're a functional fitness company. We're not a we're not a spin company. We're not a Pilates company. We don't do Zumba. That's fine and well, but that's not our thing. So we need to say no to those opportunities and just pursue what we're good at and we're experts at. And I think that's something that's big. And then also just looking at business like a sport. You know, Mark Cuban has this book called The Sport of Business, and I think it's a phenomenal example of how to look at things. You know, I, I think as we get older, we can continue to compete on a regular basis. And one way to compete is in the sport of business. You never know who's coming at you, when they're coming at you. Keeps you on your toes. And so I think that's good business advice is to look at it like that. That's funny. That book's in my queue right now. I just bought it like uh, maybe a week or two ago. Super short. Yeah. It's, it's a yeah. short, I saw yeah. it's a really short read, but I've heard it got great reviews. I heard great yeah. things about it. It's in regards to what you just talked about, uh, Jack Welch's winning and crucial conversations are great for the saying no and those hard conversations. Like those are great reads for that. Outside of fitness, what are your interests? Um, obviously my family, right? That's, that's <clears throat> probably, that's, that's top of the list. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to roll jujitsu. I mean, I guess that's part of fitness. I like to mountain bike. That's part of fitness too. <laughs> yeah. um, basically, just spending time with my family, traveling, eating good food. Uh, that's that's pretty much what we're into. I mean, that's that's what we enjoy. do. You, do you ever have moments because you do so much fitness stuff, and that is a passion of yours? Do you ever have moments where you feel like it uh, kind of consumes you, and you need to detach, and you just need to get away? Do you ever get that feeling? I mean, it used to be sometimes like that. With uh, you know, I'd be in the gyms all the time. I was competing. I was spending three hours a day training, four hours a day, whatever. Sometimes that's where I needed to kind of like take a break. But now. I use fitness as my outlet. Like there's nothing else I'd rather do. Like this morning, yesterday morning, every morning, I'm up early, I'm in the garage or I'm at a gym and I'm working out. And that's just the way my day goes. And it's a way that I, I set my mindset, I set my mentality and it just makes me feel good. So I don't use fitness as a as a fitness tool. I use fitness as a mindset developer, a relaxation tool. And then obviously fitness is a byproduct and looking fit is a byproduct. It is. I've, I've, that's how I've used fitness for years. And it's uh, ironically keeps you more consistent because as your life changes, your fitness can change along with it. So stress, a lot of people stop working out when shit goes you know, wrong in life. Oh yeah. And I f- turn to fitness when shit goes wrong because it's my, my solace. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, uh, I had our crew bring, um, you know, gear in the back of the truck and I kept it at the hospital for a month. Just, I would just go out there, pull out a barbell, pull out some plates do box jumps onto the tailgate, whatever. Because that for me is was a good outlet, right? So I would leave the hospital room, go work out, come back, I'd be energized, fired up. And then that energy and that fire up um, was kind of like, you know, share with the group inside the hospital mm-hmm. bed, right? Like it was, 
you know, they saw my energy and I think it just bled over and then it made me feel better, right? Less stress. Mm. Mm. How did the, how did that experience change you going through that? Oh man. I mean, yeah, we're just totally different people. Yeah. I mean, like how, um, you know, it's funny on, on social media, I put up the night that my daughter was diagnosed, just that I really wanted prayers and positive vibes. I've never asked anybody for anything on social media and I just needed it now. Right. But what I said on there was like life changed. Right. And I think at the time I, I wrote it, I didn't really know what I meant, but I, I figured it would change my life. And it has, right? It's made me more compassionate. It's made me more, um, you know, just uh, even more caring to my children, obviously, and then and then even more in love with my wife. I mean, we met at 14, and you never know how a situation like this is going to change her. And, dude, she's just an all-star. I mean, she's a badass, and, and she's the best. And so for that, I'm eternally grateful. And just learning about family and close friends and how when things are, are really wrong, you know, those are the people you could depend on and everything else is just noise. And I think, so it's taught me a few things, you know, mainly that family and friends should be held like gold because, you know, every morning I'll never forget this. You know, we were in the hospital. We've probably been in the hospital a total of like two and a half months, right? Ish, give or take. But for one straight, st- uh, we were in there for like a month straight and I'll never forget like every day I would just wake up. My father-in-law would just be sitting in the waiting room. This is like at six in the morning. I'd just be like, what the hell are you doing here, man? He'd be like, where else am I supposed to be? I was like, got it. You know, like that's, that's it. It's just like, where else am I going to be when my, you know, my granddaughter's in the hospital. And so I think for to see that kind of dedication, then also with my family, they took our son, they, they did so much stuff, just changed the way I looked at family dynamics. And then I also think just, it taught me to be more at ease through life situations. You know, I'll be driving and, and I just saw this earlier today. Like someone's just laying on their horn into someone, right? Just being a dick. Just like, bro. Just be easy, like relax a little bit, man. Like it's all good. Right, life could be a lot worse. Yeah, like dude, have you ever been like in the ICU with cancer patients? Like once you have, it'll just change your whole perspective because there's families and they're just broken. You know, I've witnessed personally four families now, or three families get get told their kids had, were diagnosed, like almost right in front of my eyes, right? And the look on their face and the grayness, I assume I looked the same, right? Just boom, tears, boom. And it's just like that moment right there, we should be grateful for anything else but that. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of times we don't count our blessings. We always count how negative people are. Like we're just, we automatically gravitate towards the negative. I mean, look at the news, right? The news is nothing but negative, negative, negative because people gravitate towards that. And I think we need to, as a society, gravitate towards what's positive in life. because it'll make us a lot more friendly, you know, a lot more happy, you know? And, and I think going through this situation has really helped me um, to always reflect. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I got a gold, go gold bracelet on. I, I consistently um, make a commitment to do certain things to that once this whole period of our life is over, I don't ever want to forget. I don't. I want to be constantly reminded because it will be a constant reminder of the blessings that we've been received through this experience and how grateful we are that our daughter will be fine and how there is a family every day that's getting the same news we got. And we should just be grateful that we're good, you know. And I think that's that's how it's changed me. What's uh, explain the go gold? I'm not familiar with it, Jay. So pediatric cancer, the color for it is gold. Oh, okay. Most people wouldn't know about it because I mean they know about pink because of breast cancer, yeah. but pediatric cancer is one of those things where it's a little bit. Uh, no one really wants to know it exists until you're in it, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of a polarizing, very aggressive type thing, and I think we need to normalize it a little bit, right? Just let people know that there are success stories. There's a lot of bad stories too. But, you know, we're an example of my daughter's done with treatment in six months. And after that, we'll, we'll have some things we got to do, but she'll be fine. And uh, I think just normal, you know, letting people know that, you know, September's Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month, gold's the ribbon color, just stuff like that. Just being aware of it. Are you, um, do you and the family uh, eat differently now because of what she's gone through? Do you guys have a different diet because of that at all? Or My my wife does something called Ava's Kitchen, which is an annual um, donation, uh, uh, annual charity event that she has with Michael Mina, who's a, who's a chef, um, which we're super grateful for. She has something on Instagram called Ava's Kitchen. Super cool. They put out recipes every night that she cooks for the family. Um, I don't think our food has necessarily changed. Change. Um, I think we're more aware of what we're eating, but... I, I think we always have been. So, um, you know, we've we've been told different things about keto diet, this diet, that diet for for to benefit the cancer cells. But for us, um, we have a proven. They gave us a, a roadmap when we first started this whole thing, and we were sticking to the roadmap. And that roadmap, two or three years from now, might be totally obsolete based on new science. But that's what we had at our hands when she was diagnosed, and that's what we're going to go with. Yeah. 
I had a, I had a close uh, family member who was diagnosed years ago, and when you're in that situation, it's uh, it's hard to explain to other people because you you go you try and do your research, you go online because you just want answers, and there's a million and one different things that you're going to read, and all yeah, these people want to sell you something, and you're in such a vulnerable position. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult, uh, difficult, what, what type of, uh, if you don't mind me asking what type of cancer. So she has a uh, leukemia called okay. ALL. So, mm. um, ALL is a, a type of leukemia. We're super grateful. It's, it's, it's a Very treatable, treatable. Yeah. It's a two and a half year treatment process. And, uh, for boys a little bit longer cause it comes back in the testicle. Um, but two and a half years were, you know, she got ja- diagnosed January 20th, 2016. Here we are almost January 20th or, you know, leading up, you know, we're in November now mm-hmm. or whatever. And so she, she's, she's reaching, uh, reaching the end of the cycle. How has she done throughout the whole thing? Uh, Good. Yeah. Good. I mean, honestly, a young girl could do that. I mean, honestly, like, what am I supposed to say? I mean, I I can't complain, you know, again, it's just all perspective on it. You know, one person's tragedy, maybe, you know, for us, it's just, you know, it's, you can learn a lot from children and and their strength. Oh yeah. And when you see other families going through certain things, you know, it makes me feel, um, it makes me feel bad that I even can sit here and complain, which why I don't complain, right? Mm-hmm. I can't complain about it because I've seen so much worse. We're super grateful and she's done really well. Have we had really bad moments? Yes, we've had really, really bad moments. But um, I'll give up all those bad moments for a good outcome compared to other people who might not be the other way around. Right. Mm-hmm. right? Do you have a um, like an ongoing foundation or anything like that where people can donate to? Or So we're really careful about you know people donating to anything that we have control over because I never wanted anybody to think that they gave any money to me personally. Right. Mm-hmm. We've never mm-hmm. taken a dime from anybody for anything because frankly, we don't need it and that's not, a, that's not right, right? Mm-hmm. right. So instead we donate to this company called Jesse Reese Foundation, um, which is really easy because it's kind of like, like a, they allow us to manage this account but we don't touch the money, right? We kind of let them know where we want to spend it at and what we want to do, but they, um, but they ultimately have the money. Yeah. I, I've seen you, I've seen you at the Stanford. Uh, I saw you had a, a, a booth out there for that foundation. That was the, um, God, what's it called? It's the children, the children's hospital out Palo Alto. Yeah. At yeah, Lucille Packard. Yeah. Lucille Packard. So yeah. I, I've seen you out there. So we I, offered yoga at Lucille Packard for a long time. We're going to start it back up when they move over. Right one of the things that we recognize being inpatient is that people need fitness to, to, to stay active, oh, to keep man. in mind. Exact so we, same thing I, re- I saw when I went through the process. Exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you see a lot, you see the, the people getting treatment or whatever, and it's like, and the, and the family members around them, they would benefit so much from, Yes, yeah, you know, so we started providing yoga there, 100% cool. complimentary. Right? That's awesome. We, we, we removed it last, like two weeks ago, because we're going to reintroduce it into the new hospital. They just opened up a new hospital. I mean, that's, that, these are things that we could do, you know, and these are things that we will um, continuously be uh, passionate about, right? And that's the bigger picture about business, you know? Like, I've never been more motivated to grow our business, ever, yeah. because I want to go out there and build a great business to help people do what they love for a living, hopefully, and then to provide opportunities for other people to, to help them out, yeah. you know? I, I definitely, the reason why I was asking was because, I mean, I would, I would love to, to partner up or help uh, in any way that we can help. I know that, you know, our expertise is on the digital side and the podcasting and YouTubing and things like that. So the next time you have a big fundraiser or an event or anything like that going on, I would love to have you back on and then do whatever we can to help support. Yeah. I mean, I would just say people just go donate blood, right? Contact their local blood bank, sign up for Be The Match, which is bone marrow transplant, you know, that's, those are easy things to do. They don't cost any money. Mm. And, you know, you never know when you need blood. I don't care how much money you have. If you need blood, the only way you're going to get it is if someone had offered it up before, right? Mm. And so I think being able to donate is really important. My wife and I will be donating for the rest of our life. Um, my daughter, you know, we need to give back for the blood that she's used, right? That's kind of like my flaw. That's the way I think about it in my head, whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> well, Godspeed, my friend. Yeah, Excellent yeah, having man. you on, brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're a great guy. Huh. Well, really? Just yeah. having a good conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Thanks for thanks for coming on the show. I hope yeah, we can yeah, do things man. in the future. We'll definitely yeah. do this again for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Check it out. Go to YouTube, Mind Pump TV. Subscribe to our channel. Uh, we post 365 videos a year. Maybe one extra one. We'll see what happens. Also, if you go to mindpumpmedia.com, we have 30 days of coaching. It's available for free. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>